Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar today on how to host a safe and successful event. We're really excited to be talking to you today um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, now, of course, there's lots of measures that determine the success of an event. Um, we're very much coming at this from our perspective as a venue um, and our knowledge and experience from the last 12 months. So let's get going. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm Laura and I head up the sales and marketing for Venue Hire at RSA House. And I've been in the events in the hospitality industry for over 10 years, so plenty of experience in live events and venues and coming up to two years at RSA House. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to work with Olivia um, for the last five years. So over to you, Liv. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all well. Um, so my name is Olivia and I am the Senior Sales and Marketing Executive at RSA House. Um, so I started my journey at the venue just over two years now starting as wedding executive and then moving to the senior position early last year. Um, so I feel really lucky that I've had experience running both weddings and corporate events at the venue. So it's given me a real kind of array of knowledge in all areas. And thank you so much for joining. We're really excited to show you what we've got in store. So um, what can you expect from today and what is on the agenda? Um, so the first thing to mention is that we know that we've got both venues and event organisers joining today in the audience. So when Laura and I put all of the content together for today, we've kind of very much tried to include snippets of information that will be useful for both venues and event bookers that book venues. Um, so hopefully you'll find, you know, leave today feeling like you've got some useful information. Um, feel free to obviously grab a notepad and pen, but we will be sending around um, the presentation after for you so you can have that. Um, feel free as well to drop any questions in the question box as we go along and then we've got a Q&A session at the end so we can go through all of that. Um, so after we have introduced you to our incredible organisation that we represent and our iconic London venue, we'll be talking all things latest government guidelines relating to weddings events, weddings and events. Um, since the start of the pandemic, what to now think about when hiring a venue for your next London event. Um, all of our advice and top tips on what we've learned from hosting events during the pandemic and um, all about hybrid events. So what is a hybrid event? Why have they been working well and they'll continue to do so? Um, and then the all important question of why return to live events. Um, so here we'll be hearing from our colleague Keely Davies, who works on um, the globally reaching public events programme for the RSA itself. Um, and then finally, next, we'll be touching on how to keep your teams engaged and motivating upon your return to live events. And here we'll be hearing from our friends Nathan and Lauren from Wildfire Agency and Chili Sauce Events. So they'll be talking us through some great ideas on how to make your event um, that little bit more exciting. So over to you, Laura, to introduce RSA. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know, um, RSA House is a Georgian townhouse and we are located in Westminster. So we're just a few minutes walk from the Strand and Charing Cross and Embankment stations. So nice and central. Um, we've got 11 event spaces spanning four floors and these include a large conference and dining room surrounded by an 18th century mural. An exposed brick vault that lies underneath the venue and is a converted wine cellar. Pretty cool and an auditorium which was built on the last remaining stretch of 18th century cobbled roadway. So it still has the pavement and the street running through the space. We've recently refurbished all of our smaller meeting rooms as well, which wildly differ in decor and charisma. And we're really excited to um, see these in use really soon. So one thing we love about the house is that we have three styles of venue under one roof. So we've got historical rooms, contemporary spaces, as you'll see from these pictures, um, and unusual quirky rooms as well, such as the vault. We accommodate all types of events for up to 220 guests, from conferences to gala dinners, awards to screenings, product launches to Christmas parties, and weddings to private dining. We're known for one of our exterior doors being similar in date and style to 10 Downing Street as well, so we're popular for filming both outside and inside the venue. Um, and I thought it'd be cool to throw in a few fun facts for you. So one of the um, first demonstrations of the telephone that was invented by past fellow Alexander Graham Bell took place in the Great Room, and that was in 1877. And in 1946, Sir Winston Churchill was awarded the Albert Medal in the Benjamin Franklin Room. And this was to acknowledge his enormous contribution to progress and positive change in contemporary society. So, um, 
we also, before we sort of get into it, I uh, wanted to talk about the RSA itself, because for us, it's really important to let people know when they're hiring the venue, um, what the RSA is about and who we are. So we're the Royal Society for Arts, Manufactures and Commerce. Um, and we unite people to resolve the challenges of our time. Um, so the RSA Fellowship Network is made up of 30,000 plus change makers, all sharing this goal. Um, profits from events held at the house help to fund the RSA's charitable work, for example, sustainability, education and learning, and the future of work. Um, and some current projects include Cities of Learning, which is all about widening access to education and supporting people in finding new learning opportunities near them. And Make Fashion Circular, which is about designing a circular future for our clothing. Um, all of these projects can be found on the website. And if you're interested in supporting the RSA in any way in terms of becoming a fellow um, or hosting an event, then we'll be sharing some more information after this. Um, so Liv, over to you. Yeah. Um, so what is the latest guidance for events and weddings in the UK? Um, as we all know, it can be hard to keep up with all of the guidelines when they're changing over the last year. Um, we found it in you know, work life and personal life as well. So we're hoping that the next slide will just give you a simple overview of the, of the latest current, current guidelines. Um, obviously, this is a very simple overview. You can view the government website for a full breakdown um, of each stage and any further information. Um, another thing to mention, obviously, we, we don't have a crystal ball. No one has a crystal ball, which we, we all wish we did. I think we've all wanted one over the last year. Um, but one thing that Laura and I have both found is that since this roadmap has come out, it's been a lot easier to kind of communicate. And we've seen we've seen um, people get excited about hosting weddings and events again. Um, so starting with weddings, as you can see, um, it's very kind of simply, as you go through each next stage of the roadmap, um, the permitted wedding guest size increases. Um, so from 6, 15 to 30. And then the plan is then from the 21st of June to remove all limits on weddings. And then next, we're looking at events. And um, the key stages here to kind of look out for is that from next week, so the 12th of April, the event pilots begin. Um, so this is a series of pilot events that we'll be using enhanced testing approaches and other measures um, to run events of larger sizes, which is obviously a really key part and um, will be a big part of the roadmap. And then the next step from the 17th of May is again really key for events and very exciting. So for May, events of larger sizes are permitted. Um, we also just literally had a recent announcement from Unique Venues of London to say that this also includes gala dinners um, and charity events, etc. Um, so the capacity here is either up to a thousand people or 50% of a venue's capacity, whichever is lower. And then outdoor events can begin with a capacity of either 50% or 4,000 people, again, whichever is lower. And then from the 21st of June, again, the plan is for larger events to be permitted. Um, so yeah, it's really a reassurance to, for us to have this kind of roadmap in place, just to instill confidence in the return of our yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're so excited to get going again. Yeah, so yeah. that leads us on to then, um, I suppose, as an event organiser, what should I consider when searching for a venue for my next live event? And this is a question that we, when we've been catching up with our clients, you know, we've been asked quite a bit, um, help us to understand what changes there are, you know, we want reassurance, what do I need to consider? Um, many corporates are, you know, keen to return to live events, we know that, but caution and uncertainty does remain. Um, we very much believe that, you know, we'll see that domino effect as, as we go through once the first sort of few clients start booking, um, it will hopefully help to instill confidence amongst the rest. Um, so then, let's get to it. So, first thing I think you know you really want to consider early on especially if you have a lengthy sign-off period and legal processes is you know ask for a copy of the venue's T's and C's at inquiry stage what's their policy on cancellation postponements what are the deadlines for making decisions and if they haven't you know have a postponement clause when do you have to rebook by um, are there any price increases that you need to be aware of how does it affect your current contracted numbers or spends if you do need to postpone are you going to be looking at an increase in price um, we understand obviously the need to, to plan flexibly um, and we have been doing so over the last year. Um, we've been sending our T's and C's on request at the moment with most proposals because it's something that we're just finding we're getting asked quite a lot. Um, and so just to sort of put that in there, we, we do add that into a lot of our proposals now um, with other documents which we'll talk about. Um, and early on last year, we personally at RSA, we increased our um, flexibility in, in our T's and C's. So we now allow clients to postpone within 12 months if um, restrictions are still there. And we've been super flexible, as I say, with each and every client, which is something we're, we're really proud of. 
Um, so booking processes as well, sort of provisional holds and um, deposits, I'd really recommend that, again, this is a question that forms part of your initial inquiry. Um, and venues, you know, give event bookers as much information as you can from the start about these processes. For example, have deposit schedules changed? Um, you know, a first and second option holds still applicable or are you working on a, a different basis, perhaps a first come first serve basis for any key dates? Um, things are a bit more in demand, so perhaps, you know, you are working you know, to that basis. For example, for us, our Christmas dates um, are first come first serve. We're seeing, you know, a bit of an influx in Christmas inquiries at the moment, which is really exciting. Um, and also we're doing this with key dates. So when people are postponing events, you know, it's very much first come first serve in terms of postponed um, postponement. Um, you also want to look at venues accreditations. Um, now the good to go accreditation is great, um, but I think ideally you want to be looking for something more than that. Um, we achieved last year the highest space safer events accreditation, which certainly put us through our paces. We had, uh, you know, a fair bit to do there to, to achieve that, but we um, we did fulfil all the criteria which were set forward by higher space, and these measures exceeded the safety requirements that um, are required by the government. Um, Higher Space, just so you know, if any event organiser on here, Higher Space do run a safer events training program, um, which means you can become an accredited safer events organiser. Um, I'd highly recommend that you look at this because it will show that your delegates that you've, you know, you've taken every responsible measure to keep them safe, um, which is is just key um, at the moment. Um, we've been really lucky in the last year as well that we've been able to open when whenever restrictions have eased. Um, we've been able to you know, host meetings safely, hybrid events, virtual events, filming and micro weddings. So we um, we do have that experience in hosting safe events. However, not all venues will have been fortunate enough to have opened their doors. So over the last year, you know, they might not have opened up yet. So bear this in mind. Um, this certainly doesn't mean that they aren't capable of, you know, hosting an event or being prepared for a live event again. But if you want complete reassurance that a venue has tried and tested measures and its staff have first have first hand experience um, on running an event, then, you know, I really advise looking for those venues who have this knowledge and this expertise right now. Um, ask venues what they've done. You know, if you're inquiring, um, check out their blogs, their social media, ask them for their case studies and they'll, they'll be able to help with that. Um, venue safety measures and guides. Now, Olivia is going to talk about this a little bit more um, later on, but we've put together some documents for our clients. Um, and again, ask venues to share these documents with you if, if they have anything that, you know, is going to help to reassure your guests, information about how they're going to keep you safe at the venue, what to expect. Um, just seeing an accreditation logo isn't enough. You know, we really do recommend that you obtain that information from your venue. They're going to be able to provide you with all of that detail um give advice procedures risk assessments safety measures what's expected from you what they're going to provide what you need to provide um and this will be key uh, to giving you a good indication as to how ready and prepared the venue is um with their covid measures so that you can feel confident um, and you can share these with your attendees too Venue technology capabilities for hybrid and virtual. This is really important as well to so understand what equipment and staff are in-house, what is required from an external AV supplier, if anything. Um, you know, if a venue works with external AV company, don't be put off by this at all because, you know, we'd hope most of the time that you can be assured, you know, reassured that the AV company is going to be, you know, they're going to be experts in what they do, basically. So um, you can sort of rest assured that they'll be able to take care of things for you. Hybrid may be, you know, new to the likes of you or I, but for a lot of AV companies, they will have handled hybrid events for years and, um, you know, you'll be in safe hands knowing that they've had experience with this. Um, does the venue have hybrid packages? So ask them if they can share hybrid packages with you. Um, the quote is very much going to differ, I'd say, depending on what your brief is that you submit. So I think it's key that you provide as much information to the venue um, and or the AV company. Who are helping you um, from the start and we'll run through a bit of a list in, in a short while um, and at RSA we you know we're really really lucky we've got an amazing AB team in-house um, we've got built-in equipment in a lot of our spaces so we are ready to go we're you know pretty prepared with this and we've got a great relationship with an external AV provider as well um, so if we do require more support um, for the more sort of technical events or advanced events then we'll bring those in when we need to that we handle all of that for you. Um, and I think the big thing here is having a plan A and a plan B. 
we keep talking about this day we live, but um, we just can't stress this enough. You know, know what your plan A and your plan B is and be open and honest. Let the venue know, let your suppliers know um, from the start what your options are, what you're looking at, because um, the venue might be able to help as well. So if for whatever reason your plan A, you know, um, can't go ahead and perhaps that's being at a venue, what is your backup plan or vice versa? Um, if things can't move forwards with what your initial plan is, you're going to have to have given some, you know, some serious thought in terms of how your event would look like in a, in a different format. Um, and we know things can change really quickly. Just to give you an example, I was working with, well, I am working with a client who was due to, to host a live event for 3,000 people um, at the Royal Albert Hall in July. Um, from the very start, sort of, I knew their plan A was to host that live event at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, and they were really hoping, you know, up until a, a month or so ago that that would be the case. But um, they realised, obviously, that they, they need to go hybrid. And so I knew all along that we were their sort of backup plan. And we just kept that really open and honest communication throughout. And that sort of really helped us, I think, in the inquiry process. Um, capacities. So get all the capacities, not just your one metre or your your normal capacities even if you're looking way in advance know what the venue's capacities are pre-covid one meter two meters um we've got a bit of a chart that we we share with clients um to show them what this looks like and how this might differ um because this obviously does then affect um your sort of room setup as well so you need to think about that um and again if you if your event plans change can your plan <laughs> B go ahead at the venue with the restricted capacities or would you need to think about something else um, and in terms of budget, I think now more than ever, it's really it's really key that you're open and honest with the venue and your suppliers about your budget. Um, and what is this for? Is it for venue hire, AV, food and beverage, or do you have separate budgets? Um, I think it's just important to remember as well that venues have had a really challenging year, and you know most venues have had little to no income. Um, so pricing strategies have probably been revisited by a lot of venues, us included. Um, we're being as flexible as we can to accommodate various budgets. Um, we've introduced various new packages and pricing structures um, to help accommodate a lot of different events. Um, and a lot of venues are going to want to help, you know, that you, they want the business. Um, when we get back on our feet, you know, we're going to need the business. So especially in recent months, you know, I think just be mindful of what as well with restrictions that um, events moving forward could be more labour intensive. Um, and these costs are obviously costs that are going to have to be factored in and, and into your proposal um, and also just you know finally on costs have there been inflation related price increases that you'll need to be factored in as well so ask the venues you know how are they quoting what are they offering package wise are they still offering ddrs or is it a venue hire and minimum catering spend um, are there any change to minimum spends because obviously you might not need as much catering um, any flexibility or any offers you could take advantage of um, definitely ask those questions because I think if you don't, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, and finally, anything new from you, you know, ask your venue, is there anything that they require from your side of things that you perhaps aren't used to um, and that they, they know they're going to need from you? So to give you an example from our side of things, we send out a pre-event guide um, to event organisers and we ask them to share this with all the attendees. Um, and as part of this, we ask our clients to sort of have a COVID safety officer from the team who can help us as the venue to remind delegates of the safety measures when, when they're at the venue um, and whilst we're on site because people do forget, you know, people get a bit excited and, and can tend to forget the rules. So it's just also coming from your side as, as well as us as a venue. So that's something that we require from, from event organisers. So, um, Moving on to the next slide, we, we recently surveyed 40 event bookers and asked them, um, whilst COVID-19 remains an issue, what are the top three criteria that will help to decide which venue you book um, once live events can resume? So this is no real surprise for us, I suppose, is it? Um, it's reassuring to know, though, that sort of our assumptions are backed up by the top answers being venue safety measures, um, flexible T's and C's, and AVID, AV hybrid capability. So, um, I think it's really key that venues get on board to support these criteria because it is going to be super key moving forwards. Over to you, Liv. 
Hi, everybody, and thank you. Um, so, how can I make sure my event attendees feel safe and want to attend the event? Um, so again, when Laura and I were putting together the content, we both agreed that this is the most important thing that we're going to be talking about. Um, of course, naturally, safety is the first thing on everyone's mind at the moment, and it's obviously our top priority. So um, yeah, we'll just be sharing a few key learnings um, of what, what we've learned. So um, here's a few pictures from a case study event that we did. So um, back in August last year, we joined forces with the event booking platform Hirespace um, to deliver our first successful safer event. So we were one of the first venues in London to host a hybrid event during the pandemic. Um, and it was just a really good chance for us to put into practice all of those procedures that we put into place following the accreditation that, that we'd achieved with Hirespace. So it was just great to be able to put it all into practice and, and have um, real guests within the venue. And um, so, in terms of like what we've put in place, the procedures, just to give you an idea, um, so staggered arrival times of guests on the day, um, things like perspex screens during catering times, temperature checks on arrival, um, masks, as you can see from the photos, um, distancing, of course, floor signage. We had a one-way system, which we'd implemented around the house, which was the first time that we'd, we'd kind of used that. Um, so it was basically just a, a really good chance for us to take away some key learnings um, from this event and work on what, what we can improve for next time. Um, so just to talk about our top tips then from kind of one event, event prop to another. Um, so these are just sort of basically a summary of our key takeaways and as I said, learnings, learnings from the event. The first top um, priority, I would say, and one of the main things that we would, we would stress is that organisation is so key. Um, obviously, as event organisers, all of us, we're all natural organisers anyway, it's, it's embedded in us, um, but making sure that every last detail is planned and nothing is left to chance is so important now. So by that we mean if you're unsure about something as an event organiser, lean on your suppliers, ask your venue, just make sure that you feel comfortable and you're aware of everything. Um, so the next point, obviously, Laura touched upon accredited suppliers, um, but this is something that's so key now, and it's not just venues um, that, that should be accredited, it's suppliers as well that you're working with, so whether that be, you know, an audiovisual company or an entertainment company, making sure that you know what their procedures are and how they're going to keep everyone safe is really key. Um, next thing is, and again, Laura kind of touched on it, the pre-event guides. Um, so this is something that we learn from hosting the higher space events. So, um, one of the things that people, what we realised quick afterwards is that the event that was hosted in August was, was pretty much the first, you know, social event that the team had been to since the pandemic began. Um, and what we thought was really key um, is just making sure that everyone's on the same page before the event begins. So what we did after the event is we created this pre-event guide, which now we send out to our event organisers who they can share with everyone that's going to attend the event. And what it does, it just makes sure that it just makes sure that everyone is on the same page. They know exactly what to expect as soon as they step foot in the venue, and they just feel feel reassured. Um, and that sort of come back that comes on to the next point, and that everybody um, just assume that everyone needs reassuring. So we quickly learned that that's a blanket approach of just making you know treating everyone as though they feel nervous and that they need reassuring. We'll just make sure that we cover all areas and cover all eventualities. Um, also, the, the other thing that we kind of learned as well, and what, what we were quite proud of, is that after the event, we sent out a survey, um, and nine out of 10, 10 felt that they felt really safe at the event, which, which, we, were, which we were really proud of. So that comes into my next point, in terms of if you are looking to host a live event, um, it's really key to consider how your colleagues and client apps, clients actually feel about live events. Um, so one good idea might be perhaps to share a survey um, with them, just to kind of see how they feel, gauge that you know what they're thinking and um, if they would want to attend a live event it will just kind of again keep everyone on the same page and we'll know exactly what people are thinking um, so next point again is about the importance of communication so again going back to those questions making sure that you're clear and concise from the offset rather than taking a guess um, that you're communicating with your venue with your suppliers and again everyone's on the same page um, the next point, again, factoring in more time for planning goes along with everything else that I've said. So all of these new procedures, measures, naturally, if it's the first live event that you're planning, there is going to be more that you have to think about. So just making sure that you factor in the time for that. Um, next is just to be ready. So venues, I'm sure you're exactly the same as Laura and I. Um, we're getting ready to, as soon as we're given that green light, 
going to be go, go, go. And we've got all the procedures in place to do that. So just be ready as an event organiser as well. Just um, be prepared for, for the return of live events. Um, and then finally, don't don't drop the ball. So what we mean by this is is don't be complacent. Basically, if you're looking to host a live event, um, know that venues are are getting busier. I know as soon as that roadmap was announced, Laura and I literally the phone was going, the, the emails were pinging through, and and it really picked up. So you just know that venues are kind of getting reserved um, or, or booked up for the key dates really. So just keep that in mind. Um, so next, we just thought we would share with you um, some information on inquiry levels from the e-venue portfolio. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, um, for those of you who may not know, um, Eve is a venue portfolio and it's a platform that connects you to everything you need for your perfect event. Um, so RSA House is part of the Eve um, venue portfolio along with 28 other venues. So the way in which the venues are all linked and that they're a part of the venue portfolio is that we've all got the same in-house caterers who are CH and Co. And so Eve cover the venue find, the full, of, full event service management, entertainment, and of course, as I mentioned, the food as well. Um, so as you can see from here, um, pretty much what this is explaining is that we, over the 28 venues, we reported a 45% growth in inquiries since the roadmap announcement. Um, so when are these for? So when are people looking to actually host these events? So the most popular months for people was between July and September, and that was 46% of inquiries for those months. And then that was shortly followed by October to December, where it was 35%. So it just goes to show that though it's, it's um, a kind of confidence boost that people were looking to, to host events in, in the later months from July onwards. Um, and then what types of events? It's no surprise to us that weddings and private events are at 50% of the inquiry levels. Um, weddings is something that hasn't dropped off at all. It's been very steady and busy, which is amazing. Obviously, people are still looking to get married. Um, but this is obviously shortly followed by 40% being for corporate meetings, conferences, dinners, and drink receptions, um, and then Christmas parties and filming as well. So as Laura sort of mentioned earlier, we have you know, we've had some inquiries coming through, we've had some Christmas parties, we've confirmed some recently, hybrid conferences. So things are definitely starting to pick up and I think people are getting excited about the return of live events. Um, and for venues as well, if you're anything like us, filming has definitely kept us afloat um, over, over the last month. So that's been really good. Um, but over to Laura, I think you're going to introduce hybrid events now. Yeah, yeah, I know. Thank goodness for filming. That's I know. Goodness, goodness <laughs> <going>. <laughs> Um, so then, what should you be considering when planning a hybrid event? Um, so for those of you who might not know, um, a hybrid event is the combination of a live event with a virtual one. So it's a blend of both audiences and it gives the opportunity for attendees to experience the event in person, at a venue or globally over the web. Um, so as we'll, we'll, we all know, virtual has definitely served its purpose and will continue to do so. Um, but hybrid really now is taking shape and, and you know, moving us into the new normal um, and it will be here to stay, um, especially over the next sort of 12 months. Um, so we, we really need to embrace it, everyone. Um, so I recently caught up with Pete um, who, from Radiance Production, who we work with uh, to help deliver some of our hybrid events and to ask him what information does he need basically as a starting point when helping to quote for, an, for a hybrid event. And here's must-haves um, are type of event, purpose of event, so understanding what you're trying to deliver and who to, um, number of people attending in person and remotely, and number of people presenting um, in person and remotely. Your chosen platform, and if you don't know what platform you're using or you know that's not something you've thought about yet, then that's something that your AV company can certainly help with and help recommend. Um, are rehearsals required as well um, and an idea of budget so they're just sort of I'd say like as a starting point if you're thinking about a hybrid event and reaching out to a venue or um, an AV supplier those are some some good uh, sort of pieces of information that you can share to give you a good starting point for them to quote. So I've included some of our points here and Pete's top tips as well if you're coming to plan a hybrid event what you need to be thinking about so first off preparation is absolutely key um, Preparing a successful hybrid event takes longer than the equivalent live or virtual event, uh, believe it or not, because it's like preparing both, essentially. Um, so they take a huge amount of you know, time, content, preparation. Um, so don't underestimate this. Um, I think 
like I, like I mentioned before, um, having like a short, clear remit of, as to what your purpose is um, and share this with the venue, share this with, this with the AV team so that they can really understand your vision and what you're trying to achieve and help you to reach your desired outcome. Um, what's, you know, what's your event objective? What's the purpose? What are you trying to achieve? Um, this is something that we certainly really like to dig deep into when we get inquiries. You know, for us, it's not just, it's another hybrid inquiry. It's okay, well, what, how can we help you bring this to life and, and to really make it the best that it can be? Um, it's all about the experience and making it, you know, as engaging as possible. Consider the order of your content as well and what you need to do to keep those engagement levels up. So for both audiences, live and, um, you know, from, from home or wherever they are around the globe, um, this can't just be the ordinary format anymore of an event that you're used to and what you once knew. Um, so consider how much interactivity there's going to be, um, you know, are the speakers all at the venue or are they going to be a mix um, or will they all be presenting remotely? Um, how much movement is there going to be on stage? Do you anticipate cameras needing to be all around the room and sort of tracking um, speakers or is it going to be much more, you know, focused on one speaker and you just need that static camera? Um, a lot of hybrid events now are sort of like TV productions and require two teams. So you'll have sort of one to work on the virtual and one to work on the live. So, you know, be clear on, on all this level of detail. And it, it sounds a lot, but it will piece together. You just need to really think about all of these these bits and pieces um, because, you know, who's managing the Q&A? Um, how are you going to make those who are attending virtually feel as included as those in the room at the venue? They need to have the same experience as those in the venue, if not you know, a better experience. Um, and when it comes to your platform, so consider what platform you're going to be using. Do you have to use a particular platform with your company? Um, if you're at the beginning stages, this is certainly something, as I mentioned, that, you know, the AV team can definitely help with. We have clients that come to us and have no idea what, what they need to do or use. And so based on their brief, um, Radiance um, and our AV team in-house can recommend what they use. And, and sometimes it is just simple Zoom. Um, Zoom is uh, at obviously the lower end of the, the price um, of the market um, and it still has that chat and Q&A feature which is great and you can go into breakout rooms. Um, there are more middle ground um, platforms. One that Radiance is currently working with um, for a client is, is called AirMeet um, and this platform has the capability to host really lively conferences. Um, you know, attendees can build profiles when they go in there. The platform can have backdrops, can be branded. Um, you can run multiple sessions at once and um, participants can choose to network as well if they want to and they can meet others in a lounge beforehand during or after and they can sit at virtual tables so there are really um, there are lots of different platforms out there definitely recommend speaking to your, your AV company just to understand um, what's best for you and what you're trying to achieve and who's attending um, there are more enhanced platforms as well and, and advanced platforms so bespoke build is, not, is a possibility you know if you've got the budget um, AV companies can bespoke build platforms, so this could be a possibility. Um, consider rehearsals, and um, we definitely say factor in rehearsals. Um, some people say oh, we don't need rehearsals, but you know, at the end of the day, experience in addressing two separate audiences really does take practice. So by having rehearsals, it will allow um, you to practice, and it also means your AV company can advise on perhaps those things that won't translate in the new format. Um, and venues also need to factor this into your quote. So, you know, don't be alarmed if you are going to be charged for a full day before, perhaps, um, because, you know, that they do need to bear in mind that this will take out time of the venue as well. So factor that into your, to your quote and to your budget. Um, and when it comes to budgets, um, I guess online and hybrid events are not always cheaper. So um, don't always think it's going to be a cheap alternative. You know, they take more manpower and, and therefore, you, you know, you're going to pay for this. Um, but hybrid events can happen at a variety of different budget points and it's worthwhile, I guess, making sure that in the early stages of the planning process, you have both the technical and the platform costs. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, the technical costs from your AV um, company, the crew, the, the equipment, and then your platform costs, what that's going to include as well. Um, and the platforms do differ in price. Like I say, some clients have bespoke platforms built um, these take time to set up and customise. Um, so other, others might be just happy with sort of a Zoom webinar or a meeting, which is obviously less customization, but it will come in at a lower price point. And finally, um, something that we always, uh, you know, ask, especially, you know, at the beginning of an inquiry stage, 
catering might be the last thing that you're thinking of when it comes to organizing a hybrid, but you're still organizing an event at the end of the day, you're still having a live event um, as part of it. So you really need to think about what you're gonna feed um, guests and speakers. If it's just basic refreshments you're after, can the venue provide these or can you bring your own in? Do they allow that? Um, it might, might also be um, that the venue needs to know this at quoting stage because there might be minimum catering spends that need to be factored in. Um, so provide as much information as you possibly can. Um, I mean, from our point of view, we've tried to be pretty flexible, especially at the moment. And, um, you know, we've, we've been able to lower minimum catering spends um, and accommodate various different requirements at this stage. So I think, again, um, not speaking for all venues, but I think venues are going to be have more flexibility on this at the moment um, than ever before. So, and another question I suppose is really key here and it's something that we wanted to address because online events have been working well for so many. And so the question might be, well, actually they've been working so well, why should we come back to live events? And there are loads of reasons. Um, and there are lots of advantages obviously of live events. They've been a saving grace for so many of us over the last year and we've all been able to stay connected virtually and grow our network and it's just been amazing. Um, but live events do, sorry, uh, virtual events do take a huge amount of thought, time and preparation. Um, so many of you who are joining today, I know some of you have, have had have faced your own stresses and struggles and there've been loads of factors outside of your control. Um, that you, you, know, you, you just don't have control over compared to when you hold a live event. So we're gonna actually hear from our colleague, Keely Davies, who works on the Globally Reaching Public Events Programme for the RSA. Um, I'm gonna get Keely's views on what's worked well for them since going fully virtual, but most importantly, what they are missing as a team from the live events and what they're most looking forward to. Hi, my name is Kiwi Davis and I work on the Public Events Programme for the Royal Society of Arts. Our programme is globally reaching with speakers and audience members from all over the world and just like everyone else in March last year we had to quickly change the approach and format to our events. We went from a programme of live events with an online live stream option to 100% virtual events. Uh, I'm sure you can all imagine what went into flipping the programme on its head like that extremely quickly. Um, we the impact of those changes were completely unknown to us, but um, there did end up being a lot of things that we benefited from by taking the programme exclusively online. Uh, we already had a global programme with audience members and speakers from all over the world, but actually that was opened up to us even more. We didn't have to get speakers in the room at the same time anymore. As long as we could align diaries and time zones, we were good to go. Um, I don't have to worry about capacity. Uh, room capacity. Uh, I can make as many tickets available as possible for each event. So our live viewing numbers and ticket uh, registrations have quadrupled. Um, and we have more control over certain things during the event. So for example, if we have an audience member who's been overly combative in the event chat or the Q&A, we have the ability to monitor that as we go and take action if we need to without any disruption to the event, to the attendees or to the speaker's experience. There are still drawbacks, of course, to virtual events. There's only so much you can control. You know, you could have the most engaging and famous speaker, but if their video or audio quality is poor or bad Wi-Fi connection, uh, that, you know, we can't control that. Um, we do, of course, contingency plan, um, but, uh, you know, ultimately there's only so much you can do. Um, in my opinion, though, I don't think anything's going to take over from live events entirely, and I'm really looking forward to getting back to the new normal. Um, you know, I miss the atmosphere in the room, the feeling when speakers walk into the room and onto the stage and the audience members start to applaud. Um, it's just really exciting. Um, you know, you can build your brand in different ways in the room during a live event. You've got the ability to use lighting, music, staging, room setup, food, you know, drinks. All of those things can have a huge impact on the um, energy and the atmosphere in the room. You know, attendees want knowledge, interaction, connection. Um, and to be live in the room with speakers, um, you know, you've got the energy and that exclusivity as well. Um, you know, missing certain aspects of our events, um, like book signings and meet and greets with speakers, you know, it's, that's just something you can't experience in the same way virtually. You know, looking forward, um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing familiar faces on my return to live events, you know, not just audience members, but my colleagues that I work with across the organisation. Um, 
I think finally, you know, nothing replaces human interaction. And if anything, the past has proven that. Um, you know, it's human nature to want to be with others. It's human nature to want to be with our communities. And what I mean by communities is people with the same interests, love of the same bands, the same authors or speakers. Um, and whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you want to be there and be part of that experience and, and, and experience that atmosphere um, in the room. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think moving forward, we're all going to end up, you know, like I said, doing a hybrid style event, taking the best from virtual, the best from in-person events and creating a super event. Oh, it was great to hear from Keely, and we cannot wait to host the RSA public events programme again. Um, so just to pick out some of the key Hi. points, um, why you should return to live events. Um, I mean, from our point of view, there's so much that we miss um, yeah. out of the venue and meeting our clients, seeing, you know, their faces, physically experiencing those elements of an event that come together in front of you. And I think just seeing that human interaction and smiles on faces, people trying our new food, our new menus and sharing those experiences, people catching up, meeting new people, that energy, that atmosphere just you know it can't be replaced and to me all of those elements make for a more sort of tangible fulfilling event and they help illuminate a brand and bring a story to life so yeah it was really great to hear from Keely and I know you're watching so thank you mm -hmm. um, and finally I think you know venues have worked tirelessly they've invested and they've worked really hard to ensure that it's safe for you to return so when we are able to do so you know we are ready to go um, and bring it on <laughs> we can't wait <laughs> um, and definitely one thing I've missed is this uh, showstopper dessert station. This is our interactive edible dessert station, which is built right in front of your guests live at the event um, by our team of chefs. And I cannot wait to get back to it. When I know, it's we love it, don't we? <laughs> I really miss seeing them. It's always such a hit, isn't it? That no. People just love it. Um, so I was just going to mention, as it were, as I did earlier, um, CH and Co are our in-house caterers, and um, we're really, really lucky that we have such a creative and immersive um, catering company that we represent, which you can see from from one of our famous dessert stations here. Um, so one thing that CH and Co understand is the fantastic role that food can play in a live event, um, and as both Keely and Laura said, it's just not something that you can get from a virtual event. So food is so important. Um, we've literally recently just launched our 2021 menus, which are packed full of creative and delicious options to choose from, um, which you know, we're really excited about. Every time we look at them, we get hungry, don't we? <laughs> um, and one thing that is very much at the forefront and you know, is at the heart of what CH and Co represent is sustainability and, and wellness. So um, within the menu, they within the menus, they've increased um, vegan meals by 15%, reduced the use of plastics by 25%. And they celebrate local and seasonal produce by sourcing from local suppliers wherever possible. So that's obviously really key and very important to us. So the next question, how are venues adapting their catering offer and service and how should I plan the menu for any upcoming events that I've got? Um, so we're just going to, as I mentioned before, we have recently just launched our new menus. Um, so there's such fantastic options in there. And I think the main way that we've adapted what we offer is that we can be flexible with, with what we have on the menu. So, um, you know, never be afraid if you are looking to, to book a venue for your event, lean on the venue or the catering provider. They'll offer you advice on, on what options might work well, um, perhaps what they've done over the last year, depending on when, when your event is, what might work well. Um, so for example, like the, the micro weddings that we did last year, the one thing we had to do, which actually was, was a huge hit, was um, have individually plated canapes, which is something we'd never really done before. But actually, it was really good. It just meant that everyone had their own plate of canapes, and obviously because the service style was slightly different. It's things like that. There are ways around um, making the catering, you know, different and, and altering it slightly. Um, other great options include our bento boxes. Um, so these weren't something that were kind of... Um, something we offered all the time actually at RSA but they've been such a good option and um, so we serve them at this higher space event and just seeing like um, all of the team like when they came down for lunch you could just tell it was a bit more exciting than a normal sandwich sandwich lunch it was just a bit something a bit better and um, the other thing that's been great and that we've included in our menus is things like um, individually packed bre breakfast bags and um, things like sandwich bags which are just such an easy grab and go option um, and it means obviously you're limiting touch points and things like that as well. Um, 
as I said, like make sure just to ask all of the questions. Um, there's things like as well, just another example, we've got some epic options on the menus, like our street food and market stall style menus, um, which has always been a massive hit. Some of these, obviously, they're typically meant for standing style events, but they can be adapted and they can be changed um, in order to meet to meet whatever restrictions may be in place. So make sure you ask all the questions with regards to that. Um, so next up, um, how can I keep my teams motivated and engaged during events? Um, Obviously, this is really important and um, people have been working from home like us, most people for the last 12 months and they're feeling ready to be re-energised and re-engaged again. Um, I don't know about me and Laura right at the start of the pandemic, we're cooking all these really exciting lunches and sharing pictures of what we had for lunch, but that's totally dropped off now and I'm really bored with my sandwiches and stuff at home. So um, when you come back to live events, having creative lunch options um, is really important and not something to, to kind of... Um, Brush over. So the idea, what we've included here, is our fueling not feeding concept, which isn't actually a new concept. Concept we've done it um, across the venues for quite a long time, and um, it's always been an option that's really appealed to our clients who book like full day conference packages, for example. And um, because often when you're at a venue and you've got you know breakfast, lunch, sugary snacks throughout the day, guests can often feel sluggish and tired as the day goes on. So food plays such an important role to make sure that you feel energized and. And that your concentration levels are up and um, so they're basically designed to fuel your guests keep them revitalized fresh and engaged throughout the whole day and um, so to give you an idea of what they include what kind of options um, so there's chocolate chai seed coconut energy balls smoothies the bento boxes and um, vegan flapjacks things like that just something that's, that's really interesting um, one other thing that, that's really good and what can keep your keep everyone engaged during the event, um, we can offer a talk, for example, from our company nutritionist, Amanda Ursel. Um, so she can actually come. She did it for the Higher Space event, actually. She joined virtually um, and she gave a talk on, you know, how to how to manage a healthy, balanced diet. And although it may not relate, you know, exactly to what your agenda is for your event, people will find that really interesting. And I think it's just something that people want to know about. Um, again, it's not just catering, we can also provide a member of the RSA team to do a short welcome talk on the venue, so I'm sure there's lots of venues on here which have got some incredible history um, and they've got organisations behind the venues which um, a lot of attendees will find interesting, but a lot of the time at RSA we'll find that, um, you know, whatever the event concept is that the client has, it can correlate quite nicely perhaps to one of the projects that the RSA is working on, um, so it Kind of creates a really really interesting aspect to your event and um, again other ideas things like you know ted talks and um, over the last year there's been ted talks that have popped up on my linkedin and they're always like a couple of minutes videos that i just really like listening to because they they make you feel motivated and there's often like an, an inspirational speaker on there so perhaps pop in pop in some of them in your agenda as well um, the other great option is team building activities. Um, so from conferences to parties, keeping guests engaged by doing um, team building activities and adding a bit more excitement is something that um, works really well. So we're really excited to share a short clip from our friends at Wildfire and Chili Sauce, um, who are experienced agencies. We asked them to cover ways to enhance your live event and provide some ideas and inspiration of what you can do. Hello, my name is Lauren Goff and I head up the events team at Chili Sauce. The Benjamin Franklin room is the perfect spot for a drink reception with a capacity of 150 guests. The space lends itself well for a range of entertainment such as interactive games, photo booths and roaming bands. For those more intimate affairs, the tabin has a capacity of 80 guests for a party. This space lends itself well as a room can accommodate a range of entertainment from themed race nights to casino nights to our popular pub Olympics. It's not even summer yet and I'm already thinking of the C word, Christmas. The vaults has a capacity of 220 guests for a party. The space lends itself well with it being a blank canvas. We can provide a range of theming and props from your traditional Christmas winter wonderland to your classic Las Vegas casino to your glamorous night at the movies. The list goes on. The 
quick snapshot of the entertainment options at RSA House. If you'd like to hear about our other options, please don't hesitate to get in touch with myself or the RSA House team. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nathan. I'm the Managing Director of Wildfire. And I'm here to talk you through some of the fantastic team building events that we can do at RSA House. So to begin with, we have the Durham Street Auditorium. Now this space is nice and big. You can get lots of people in there and you can have them all socially distanced. And with the large screen at the front, this is ideal for our commercial team break. Now our commercial team break means that you would have a group split into teams who each have video cameras and they have to make a TV advert. Now, as you can see from this image just here, you're able to do this by having people socially distanced all the way throughout, make sure that there's enough space between people. And then when they come back to watch the actual adverts at the end in the auditorium, then they will be able to be socially distanced still and everything will be able to be sanitized and everything is safe for everybody while they're taking part. The next room, the great room. Now this room really is great. It is a massive space that lends itself to so many different activities that we're able to do and able to make sure that we do this in a safe way. Now, one of the events that we would suggest that we can actually run hybrid or live. So if you have people who don't feel comfortable coming into the venue, if you want to have some people in the venue and some people from home, then you can actually run this event as a hybrid or you can run it completely live. This is where a group is split into different teams. They have to paint different sections of a picture that all comes together to make one big masterpiece. And you would be able to do this by having people socially distanced at all times. At different areas of the room, we would have sanitization stations so that people can make sure they are clean and everybody feels safe at all times. And this would work perfectly in the great room. If you would like to know any more information about any other activities we can run at RSA House, we have countless different ones. You can either visit the website at the side just here, or you can contact myself or anybody from RSA House. Thank you very much. So I hope you'll find that interesting. It's just a few ideas on ways that you can keep everyone engaged and make your event more exciting. Um, so coming near the end now, um, we just wanted to touch on on weddings. So uh, as we know, um, there might not be anyone that, you know, perhaps is a wedding couple in the audience, but you never know, you might be looking to get married or know someone that is. And of course, there might be wedding venues that host weddings um, on here today. So we've been lucky enough over the last year to host some really, really lovely intimate, um, intimate weddings. So ceremonies and receptions, um, whether it's a couple that has changed their plans and they've gone for a more intimate celebration or couples that have found us through searching for an intimate wedding venue. Um, so one thing that we, we have learned through our inquiries that we're receiving is that intimate weddings are definitely here to stay. Um, a lot of people are considering perhaps a smaller celebration in the day and inviting a lot more people in the evening, that kind of thing. So it sparked a bit of a trend there. Um, so we just thought we'd give you a bit of snippet of information. And we asked um, wedding venue expert Emma at Coco Weddings what the future of weddings are going to look like. Um, so with um, if you if you, were, if you don't if you haven't heard of Emma before and you haven't heard of Coco Weddings, we we love the platform here at RSA. It's a venue finding platform. Um, and whenever we need like stats and figures, we always go to Emma and um, because she's great. So to give you an idea, obviously you can see the stats on here, um, but essentially as, as we would expect from that roadmap announcement, um, you know, things, things went up, people, it was instill, instilling confidence into people to want to book and start planning their weddings. So their website referrals were up by 100% and direct inquiries through the Coco Wedding platform was up by 25%, so really, really high. Um, coming then to intimate versus larger weddings. So as we would expect, the intimate builds that they have on the website has seen a massive increase and um, obviously because intimate weddings has been what's allowed and, as, and it's kind of started a trend on what, what people like. Um, but what's really reassuring to know I think for venues is that um, since the roadmap was announced on the 22nd of February the average number of guests that people are looking for their wedding for were, uh, increased from 61 to 103. So people are looking for those higher numbers still when again we're given the green light and we're able to do so. Um, I think one thing that we've learned with regards to weddings is um, that couples very much have more time now to plan, um, you know, especially where people have been at home. They've got a lot more time to look into things, know exactly what they want. You know, they're, they're focused on what they want and what they don't want. Um, 
and obviously going back to the importance of T's and C's and being really transparent from the, from the start is, is really kind of key as a venue, I think. Um, yeah, so I think we're coming to, to the end now. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's a wrap for today from us. Um, we've absolutely loved speaking to you. Sorry that we've run over. Um, run over a little bit, haven't we? <laughs> have some time for Q&A. So um, if anyone's got any questions, we'll, we'll have a look at the chat box now and the Q&A box as well and get to those. Um, but we really hope you found it useful. Hopefully yeah. you've got some key takeaways from this today. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to contact us. Um, please follow us at RSA House on Instagram. Um, connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And if you've got any useful takeaways you want to share, please feel free to let us know.